It is Sam Feifel, your host of John Updike's Ghost, your favorite little podcast about reading, literature, bookstores, uh, big giant thunderstorms that were scary, but ultimately not a big deal, and all things awesome. And I'm joined, as always, by my sister, uh, who can now trace her lineage all the way back to the Mayflower and co-owner of the bookshop of Beverly Farms. Hannah Harlow, how are you doing? Hannah. Uh, so good. Happy birthday to our mother. Yes, it's mom's birthday today as we record. Yes. Happy 75, Jeej. Uh, yeah, and that, I mean, I need to hear more about our lineage that you've been researching, but to discover we have an ancestor named Hannah from Rowley. Yeah. From like the 1600s. I mean, I didn't know that. I know. So uh, I'm not going to get into it because I could spend a very large amount of time, but our Trask roots, our grandmother was a Trask and the Trasks go all the way back to, I have uh, traced the Trask all the way back to Salem in 1636. And considering the Pilgrims landed 1620, you got to think, you know, Maybe. they were on the Mayflower or some all this time? close boat. All this time I've been giving my husband all this credit, like, oh, his family has Mayflower people. Right. I mean, I, yeah, now your kids have like multiple connections to the Mayflower. It's crazy. It is crazy. Um, but yes, but the unrelated very first, to books. Very, I know. So. Well, I'm sure they're very bookish people. But the I'm very sure. first uh, people that I can find who moved to Maine, they moved to Reedfield, Maine in 1735, were Sam and Hannah Trask. How random is that? What? That is weird. It's pretty weird. I thought that was strange. Um, you, especially since you remain in Ipswich, um, right. you, know, you just never became the Mainer that you were intended to be. But also I've always thought like, I'm kind of a fraudish Mainer because dad was born in New York and then I was born in Maine and then we moved right. to Massachusetts. But it turns out that I can trace two different lines of our family back to Maine as early as 1750. So I have like 12 generations of Maine sitting behind me. I think me. you can now safely yes. call yourself a Mainer. I am a real Mainer. Anyway, let's get to our agenda for today. Enough of this chit chat. We're here to talk about books. I have two books and then a couple other little codas. But uh, the two big books I have are this new book called Choice by Neil uh, Mukherjee. Do you know Neil Mukherjee? I don't. Booker Prize finalist. Neil is spelled N E E L. Last name is M U K H E R G uh, J W E. You sent it to me, so I didn't know if you knew who they were. It looked, I thought it looked interesting. Booker Prize finalist seemed like it had some liter literary merits. So we'll yeah. talk about it. Um, cool. And then I also reread uh, Max Berry's Lexicon because I needed Ooh. something that was just good and that I didn't yep. have to like, you know, grapple with. And uh, I have thoughts on how it holds up. Okay. Uh, and I will talk about a couple other things, but those are the two big books. What is on your agenda? I am going to talk about Sandwich by Catherine Newman, which just came out last week. Oh, that's our uh, audio book of the week, I believe. In the it was yeah, our audio book of the week. Mm. Though I actually read this one. Oh. And um, my second book is God of the Woods by Liz Moore, which comes out on July 2nd. Wow. July yeah. 2nd, that's a great day for a book. It's such a good day. People have birthdays on July know, 2nd. My 49th birthday. That'll be amazing. Um, so that sounds good. Let's start very quickly, though. I have some final thoughts on Fire Exit, which, um, okay. you know, being, uh, you know, every once in a while, you got to put some clickbait in the old headlines. Uh, yes. You know, I... You did a great job last week. Put out there that we thought this is an early contender for book of the year. I still think that now that I have finished it. But I think it was so. A apparently, have you read the Esquire article that more? I haven't. Wrote? Okay, I haven't. So, he talked about it when I saw him speak. He referenced it, and then I saw him post about it, but I haven't actually read it yet. So I would suggest that people read it. I read it now because um, he talks about this blood quantum stuff in regard to his son, because his mm -hmm. son will not be able to enroll. Yes, right, um, correct. which I'm not sure we talked about that last time. And so, yeah. you know, you were kind of talking about the perspective of, you know, him 
writing a white man looking back on, you know, getting kicked out of the nation sort of. Um, and so it was interesting to think of that. I know I did not before, if I had read the Esquire article, I might've thought more like this kid is sort of an avatar for his yeah, son in a totally. way that I really didn't understand. Um, and I think that adds an interesting layer of like him contemplating fatherhood and what is a great father and can you still be a great father if you're absent 20 years later because you died and what your responsibilities are not to die and all those kind of things are super interesting because it, you know, it kind of blames his fa his Frederick, his stepfather for, you know, kind of going off alone. And was it his mm -hmm. fault that he let him go off alone and right. you know, that sort of stuff and abandonment issues. And so actually I thought that really made the book richer for me. I'm not a big authorial intent guy, but knowing that I was like, okay, I, I see a couple more layers here. Um, yeah, no, that is super interesting. And it, yeah, I think such a good pairing to read that essay with the book. Um, I don't yeah, know if I talked about this in the, the book and then read the essay. I don't think right. you need to like have the essay available to you to understand it or anything, but like right. it just opened up new pathways for me to think about it. Well, and I, I think also, blood yeah. quantum in general, like not everyone knows what that is or the details of it. And, um, well, one thing I said in one of my Instagram videos, I don't know if I talked about it on the pod last time, but I was reading Becoming Little Shell by Chris Latre, right. And he talks about blood quantum. Because one of my questions after hearing Morgan speak was like, well, what is like, why exactly is blood quantum so wrong? And, and like, also what, you know, are you, what are some better alternatives for determining enrollment? Right. The and alternatives they, they, I don't know the answer to at all. Well, because it, 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 and it made sense to me once. Chris kind of talked about it, but was, um, talked about like maybe some sort of like culture, ta not test, but I don't know some, like if you, it's more about honoring the culture and like who the tribes. Right. Like a citizenship are test been. for like a, the yes, United States, exactly. you know, right. how many senators are there and whatnot. Yeah. Um, right. No, I mean, I think that makes as much sense as anything else. Um, I'm not a big DNA and blood guy uh, in general. Uh, I also thought it was interesting. So the Press Herald ran a uh, review of the book this Sunday by um, basically one of the first people who really called out her, what's her name? Uh, Jenna something or other. I should have had this available to me. Uh, she's the regular book reviewer for the Press Herald, and I can't remember her name, but she was one of the first people that kind of pointed out that Paul Harding. Um, was sort of taking liberties with his Malaga Island yes. book, you know? Right. And so, you know, I kind of appreciated that. And, you know, I had some thoughts about that. I haven't read Paul Harding's book yet. I kind of feel like I need to. But so it was her one of her critiques and how she closes her uh, review of the book is that, you know, we don't, you know, the perspective is so closed off because of the first person that we don't get a lot of the motivations, like why the daughter does the things she does and why the wife does the things she does. And, you know, she closes with this thing, like, you know, Morgan's a good enough writer to write from other perspectives. And I can't wait until we see that or something. And it was, I was like, hmm. I just thought it was just a super very tone deaf critique of the book. Like I thought like so much of the power of the book was that we can't know their motivations. Like, you know, that's, the, you know, I felt, I felt like I was really in the world because I wasn't getting all this insight from the other characters. And I had to navigate with our main character and try to like grapple with the things that he grappled with. It like made it really personal to me. And like, I would have thought a perspective shift where I saw the, you know, ex-girlfriend and the daughter's motivations and stuff would have like, completely and radically changed, you know, everything about the book. So I just thought that was right. a really interesting and weird critique. And I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Would you have liked to know the, you know, the interior monologue of Mary? I absolutely would not have. I mean, I think part, like part of the, right. Part of the power of the book is that she is so opaque to him, right? right? Exactly. Like, he's never known her. He's just watched her from across the river. She's also well, experiencing the daughter Mary. Oh, the sorry, mom or whatever. Right? I was thinking about the daughter. Same basic I really, thing, but I don't want to know the daughter. the daughter. No, not at all. You know, she and also she's like having a mental health breakdown for part of the book. Like, I really don't want to know her perspective. It, I think the whole point is that he's never known her, and he's trying to make these big decisions, not knowing her. Not knowing her, right? Like, right. 
Yes, exactly. And that idea that he knows her in some way because he because he's the dad him or whatever, right. right? Is like this great leap that we have to make with him. Yes, perhaps not in a good way. Like maybe he doesn't have any right to her. Right. I, I just I mean, thought it was... we get enough from Mary because we have conversations with her. Right. Exactly. Yeah, we learn. I don't know. We, I, I thought it was very strange. Uh, and also, I just don't know. She, there was like almost no mention of the dialogue with his mother and the dementia. Oh, God, it's so I just, good. And I just don't even know how you can review the book. It does not even mention the stuffed elephant. Like the stuffed elephant uh, is such a like, I don't tragic know. Tragic figure. I, yeah, I just, uh, it's just, it was, it was really, you know, and she like took all this time to explain that like Overton's not a real place. And it like exists in this like continuum of authors who make mm. them fake places as, you know, stand-ins for real places. And I was like, what? You're like everybody does that. I, 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 I like the. I, I just, just I don't know. Anyway, I wanted to just talk about that. Is you should read that review in the Press Herald. Read the book. Read the Esquire magazine. And I would like to hear your thoughts, world, um, because I don't know. I feel like I was reading the book completely different than that person. Uh, anyway, why don't we start with a brief recap of your uh, summer read event that happened yesterday any big insights or you know fun things that you pulled out of that and then maybe whatever the first book you want to talk about is it was a great event we had you know four authors and they all were a little bit different in terms of like what they bring to summer reading um so sarah shukla's pink whales we talked about and that was kind of the most classic summer read right. we had your Met your qualifications of Memorial Day to Labor Day, yeah. um, which none of the others did. Oh, man. Um, Namrata Patel's book, The Curious Secrets of Yesterday, it's set in Salem. It's um, it ends just before Halloween. She was like, I wanted to set a book in Salem that like didn't take place Halloween. over Halloween, <laughs> but was a place that would be really welcoming to this multi generational you know, family of Indian immigrants and their spice healers. So there's like not magic to what they do, but people could interpret it that way. Right, right, right. Um, and, and that has like a nice light tone and is kind of like a coming of age story. Um, and then Betty Cayouette's book, La One Last Shot, is a romance novel where the characters are from Salem, but the main events of the book are taking place in Cinque Terre. Cinque Terre in Italy. Oh, yeah. Um, which has I was like, and the it's restaurant like, in Portland. That's weird. But. No, uh, the beaches of Southern Italy. And it's the main character is like a supermodel. And she's trying to rekindle an old love with the, with her best friend from high school, who is now a photographer, but he's more of a mid-tier photographer. Ah. Um, so that one's just like a kind of a classic romance. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And she, she act like Betty kind of knows that world. She's done, um, she's a TikToker. Oh, book, wow. book influencer. Yeah. So a she's made, she's worked with brands on like viral video content and stuff. So yeah. she like knows about shoots and uh, we should probably know. make friends with her, but something about that just like <laughs> curdled my tea. I don't know. That was gross. And then the last book was Hannah Halperin's I Could Live Here Forever. Mm. Which is maybe like the least kind of stereotypical beach read, but it is a love story, even though it's like a, you know, troubled love story about mm. a girl who falls in love with a heroin addict. Ah. Yeah. But it's in its literary. It's really I don't recommend written. it. <laughs> that actually, not the book, but the act of <laughs> yeah. falling, in love, with falling in love with a heroin addict. Yes. Yeah. Um, My roommate so they're college. all really good and it was just like a night we had a nice conversation about um, like how beach reads you know feel they're easy for the reader but they're not necessarily easy to write and, right. and like no. we actually talked about how maybe the easier something is to read the harder it is to write I think that's a general axiom yes yeah. so yeah, it was a really really lovely afternoon and um, yeah and it was raining, so nobody had anything better to do. It's great. Yeah, totally. It was super humid. Whoa. And then yeah. we sat, I watched some tornado warnings after that, but they were north of us, so we weren't that worried. We had a tornado warning that was included in Gloucester. Um, wow. 
So I was definitely nervous. It felt but very it strange. Yeah, it's not like we've sit, we sit through a lot of tornado warnings. First one since 2017 here. Yeah. So anyway, what's your first book? Oh, well, I was going to talk about your book. But so uh, you talked about the uh, Indian family with the spice healers. So I will yes. use that as a segue to talk about Neil uh, Mukherjee's choice. Uh, it's actually kind of like a triptych. Um, and there's like really it's three short novels. And I guess they inform each other. Um, I'm sort of skeptical it's, you know it's a they're loose ties um they're they don't is share. it called a novel on the front yeah it says a novel on the okay. front uh, but it's in three there's three books in the novel they all involve different characters um there's maybe a link between the first and the second but it's like super tenuous and i kept wondering like hmm. oh is it the is it a different dog or is it the same dog what are, you know what are we doing the here? dog is the link yeah, so um, the first book is a, so it's called Choice, and it's really uh, basically an examination of contemporary moral choices, and I would say it mostly acts as an indictment of the well-meaning liberal. I would say, mm. you know, it's it's or like at least kind of posits all of the well-meaning liberals, uh, you know, sort of choices and suggests that not all of them are as clear cut as the well-meaning liberal would believe. So the first uh, book is a gay couple where the one of the men is an economist and the other man is a uh, editor at a small publishing house. And he is the like hardcore liberal. They're obviously both somewhat liberal. But um, the editor guy is always harping on the family to, like, reuse water and to, like, keep laundry down and, you know, like, is just a sort of harping on, you know, climate change stuff. And the economist guy is always like, dude, it's not, this is not mattering, you know, like, da 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 you know, I love you so much, but, like, knock it off because, you know, the world is not going to end because I, you know, use different water for my pasta and my tea or whatever, you know, crazy stuff. So, um, and uh, they have kids and, the you know, the, the editor guy kind of resents that they have kids, didn't really want them in the first place wow. or whatever. Okay. And then um, I guess it's like, I guess it's like a big, whoa, you know, at the very end, he, like, just bails on them, like and destroys his phone and like leaves the editor. Guy. The editor bails on his life. And at the end of it, he, for some reason, takes the family dog and like puts it in the median um, so that it will likely get hit by a car. It just kills their dog for reasons like the dog has arthritis and maybe it's like a mercy killing. I don't know. And oh. then the second book starts with a woman oh, taking picks up the dog. an Uber home that hits the dog. But then there's oh. also a boy involved. And like, also the way they described the streets didn't seem like the same kind of streets. So I don't know, maybe it's like sliding doors moment or whatever. But so the second book is about an academic, well-meaning woman who does not report this hit and run. Like she's in this Uber, the Uber driver hits the boy and the dog and she doesn't report it because the guy is like an immigrant and it's going to ruin his life or whatever. Her And then and her like <laughs> Indian a uh, friend who is a writer is like, man, you're a bad person for not, and they aren't friends anymore. And then the third book is um, a, a very poor family in India who are given a cow by these well-meaning town liberals. It's meant to like bring them out of poverty, but instead the cow ruins their life and um, wow. the dad ends up getting murdered by cow smugglers, which I didn't Yikes. Know. Yes. Okay. So, Spoiler uh, yeah, well, I mean, so the thing is, I, I don't recommend, I don't know why you would read this book. I don't know why you, I'm not recommending it to anyone. It, okay. all of the characters are unlikable, every single character. Yeah. And I think on purpose, right. We're supposed to like right. see all of these gritty, bad people in their gritty, bad light. And you're like, oh, this person would classically be posited as a good person, but look how bad they actually are. Uh, you know, and it's like, oh, poor people aren't good just because they're poor. They can still be assholes. And, you know, right. oh, you know, just because you're an editor at a publishing house and have all these liberal beliefs doesn't mean you're a good person. Oh, just because you study like old poets like Spencer doesn't mean like your moral compass is correctly attuned. Right. 
I don't know. I just don't know what, I mean, I guess it's meant, it's meant to make, you know, sort of typical unthinking liberals like think about the choices they're making and how they're not actually as morally high ground as they think they are. But I already have sort of grappled with those things and uh, just, just, this is, I read a book about a bunch of miserable people being miserable. And right. Yeah. yeah I mean, I get right. Like everything's more complicated than you think it is. Everything's not black and white. And like, yes, where there are a lot of well-meaning liberals who are being crappy without realizing it. But I also like don't like, I don't know where people are trying to be good. I, I, yeah, like, or, I don't or know. Trying, <laughs> or, you know, like the thing is, I guess I'm also in all these like super leftist spaces that have just been like criticizing people like this forever. It just feels I know. like people have become punching. But not that. everyone is hanging out in those spaces. So right. I guess there are people who aren't. Right, but are they going to pick up this book? I don't know. Probably not. Maybe they will actually, you I know, know, Hey, it's Maybe. like an Indian author, a Booker prize, like, you know, yeah. people who aren't particularly deep thinkers, but are well-educated might pick this up. I don't know. I just, I, I feel like there is becoming this like straw man of like this unthinking liberal. And I think in general, most yeah. liberal, liberals are aware that they're not perfect people and that, right. Yeah. I make morally specious choices because I want my kids to have a good life and you right. know, do that. I'm not going to worry about Gaza today. I'm just going to take my kid to soccer practice and it's going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I don't know. I just, we'll I just mean, leave it at that. I, yeah. I bet it, I bet it gets some attention, but I, I don't know. I just don't know what the point is. Okay. Great. Well, Sandwich by Catherine Newman. Yeah, you like it. Because I really liked it. It's really funny. So Catherine Newman's first book was called We All Want Impossible Things, which I uh -huh. really liked. Right. Um, it's but it's about the main character is like has it her best friend's dying of cancer. Mm. So she's like taking care of her best friend and like her dying days. And so it's like super depressing, but she's so funny. So it's like okay. this hilarious book about something like super tragic mm -hmm. um which you know we've sold a bunch because whatever some people yeah i can recommend it her. but it is yeah. not it's not for everybody right. but sandwich i feel like i can just recommend wholeheartedly it is um set in sandwich cape cod this family is there for their annual week vacation during the summer and the main character is a 54 year old woman her two children are like you know young adults they're in their early 20s or whatever mm -hmm. And then she has um, aging parents who come stay for a couple of days too. So they're all crammed into this ah, small house. We're not just so, in sandwich, but we're also no. the sandwich generation. Exactly. Oh, oh. And she makes lots of sandwiches over the course of the week. Yes. Um, <laughs> so it's like, you know, there are secrets revealed over the course of the book, but it's mostly just a like pretty fun, hilarious book about like you know life is hard and like being mm -hmm. a mom is hard and being a daughter is hard and like but it's also like full of joy like there are all these moments of just like appreciation for life um so it's just it's super good i like it i like it yeah and um, it's sure you know you can read yeah. it like it's i don't know this i think is like a perfect beach read especially for like middle-aged women there's a lot about like being menopausal and oh. it's funny. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah, just like, I noticed the, the audiobook's only like six hours. Yeah. It's short. <clears throat> it's great. Nice. I like a good yeah. short book that I can crush easily. Me too. Fantastic. Um, that is actually why and this isn't necessarily a short book. It's pretty short. I mean, I finished it quickly. Um, I reread uh, Max Berry's Lexicon because. Right. I was looking for just something to enjoy. And I loved this book. Um, it's, you know, the quotes on the back I was just noticing are like, you know, Lev Grossman from The Magicians, which I love, and Austin Grossman of Soon I Will Be Invincible, which I love. And so it's like, a, I think it's a style of author where, you know, it's very literary, but without being like pretentiously literary. Actually, that was the thing about the Neil Merkaji is that there are all these like J.M. Cootsy quotes and like oh. Spencer illusions. And, you know, like there's this one, there's this What's one. What's a Spencer scene, illusion? Like Spencer is the poet. Oh. Spencer with an S. Got it. 
you know. Yep. Um, there was this one scene. What was the book? Because uh, you'll probably know the book. But there was this one scene where, you know, he was like watching something happen and, you know, oh, okay, here it is, right? Oh, we just had the most wonderful event at the Society on an Italian writer, just fascinating, so well attended, such great speakers, really terrific evening. Which Italian writer, Ayush asks, he's the publisher editor, right? Mm-hmm. And just the barest microsecond of a pause, beyond calibration, Ayush feels. Besides, it could always be his imagination. It is always in your head, isn't it? Before the answer directed with a slight turning of the head at the air, six inches at the side of Ayush's head, Primo Levi, the periodic yeah. table. And I was like, okay, I maybe i've heard i don't know if i have heard of that but it was clearly supposed to land with like this thundering like brick and right. i had no idea what to take away from it i was just like oh is that guy a bad guy or is he- i mean i know of him like is he like a nazi or something He's like a holocaust survivor that's what i thought too but it, it seemed like oh can't you know yeah like i use because i use just constantly oh. like super sensitive to like being the only like person of color in a publishing industry, right you know and like that seemed to be like oh you mean the white nationalist and i, I looked him up and i was like didn't is he like a scientist who like survived the holocaust i don't know but it was like one of those things it was like so literary right that, like i couldn't I, you know, I was like man i'm fucking literary and i was like i don't even get yeah you know a lot yeah i was like <laughs> Well, like, oh, wow, the periodic table. Oh, no. I, I don't, you know, whereas like Max Berry is much more about language than specific mm. pieces of literature. And they're very playful with language. And so the plot of Lexicon is it's like a magic school. So it's in the like, you know, Naomi Novik and Harry Potter and, you know, that yeah. so it's kind of in that genre. But the the power that they have is that they are trained in linguistics to uncover the like special words that like I can use to suggest to you to do anything. And it's sort of Mm. all based in like marketing and privacy talk. Right. So it's like, you know, when you take those like stupid, like which animal would you be on Facebook? It's actually like data aggregators, like figuring out how to target you better with advertisements. And he takes that one level more. So it's actually like a secret society that is hoovering up this information so that they can control your brain should they want to control your brain by like knowing that you're one of 137 calorie categories and therefore blah, 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 blah. And so, uh, it's just very smart. And like, I must've read it while I was in the privacy industry because I like did, uh, there's like some things that I dog eared and they are like stuff that was taken out of the privacy like space. Mm -hmm. And like, I, it still blows my mind that people do these things. Like, you know, they just give their personal data up for no reason and get targeted by ads and, you know, are completely nudged and, you know, figured, you know, people are told who to vote for. All kinds of crazy shit. They don't even realize right. it's happening. Um, so there's I, a I little remember. bit of, sounds like there's a little bit of babble in there, the RF Kuang book. Actually, just, there's actually very, yeah. quite a bit of babble in a way. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I would say, you know, it, Obviously, Babel said in the 18th century or whatever, but right. there's um, in terms of like language and the power of right, exactly. Linguists. It's, it's about like, yeah, the I mean, uh, obviously, it's attractive to people like us, but it's like, oh, what if our smartness with words actually made <laughs> right. us magicians? Oh, wow, <laughs> totally. Um, but, um, uh, it's you know, it is true. Like, I think, um, I was actually having this talk with Gus the other day because Gus, my son is uh, not always the most uh, talkative in social situations. And so he's like, some people are just good at talking and I'm not good at talking. And I'm like, I wasn't always good at talking. I have practiced and practiced and practiced talking to the point where I am good at talking in public situations. Um, And I do think like, there are times where I'm like, I just totally talked that person into doing that. And I don't even know why. I just felt like doing it. (laughs) And I think, you know, good to see if I could. people or, you know, yeah, like whatever, you know, because I will do that. I'll just take a position just like, oh, well, what if I was this type of person and I'll argue that and then I'll win the argument and be like, crap, I don't even believe right. that. It's so annoying when you do that, actually. <laughs> uh, so Ruby does it too. Ruby can like do it effortlessly. She beats me in every argument, but Gus doesn't always, you know, kind of picks arguments that are not necessarily persuasive, but, um, 
I think it's, you know, it just gets into this idea of why are people persuasive? Why do we believe the things that we believe? Why, how does language make us believe things? I don't know. I, I just think Max Berry is just a, he's an Australian guy. And, um, so a lot of it's set in Australia. So I mean, that's cool too. Um, but just super breezy, fun novel that I, I think is this also, it's like 10 years old now and it, holds up really well. Like it doesn't, oh, good. it doesn't, it was kind of of its time. Cause it's like when people are first bringing out privacy, but it right. totally holds up. Okay. Awesome. Um, my last book is God of the woods by Liz Moore, mm. which is comes out, like I said, July 2nd, it is a literary mystery is how I would describe it. Mm. And it is set at a summer camp Ooh. in the Adirondacks. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but it's, so the summer camp is owned by this family. And yeah, so they like have like, Dudley? it's like camp Sudley on Winnipesaukee. Yes. No. Um, Adirondacks is New York. I know. But I thought your camp Dudley was on. No, camp Dudley was in New York. Oh, it was? Oh, I didn't realize yeah. that. Yeah. It was on the other side um, of Champlain. Ah, so anyway, it's a family owned camp and the family has this like big, house like you know on the property they own hundreds of acres or whatever and then like over on the other side of the property are like all the cabins and the summer camp or whatever right and the so it's set in 1975 and a camper 75 yeah and it opens with a camper going missing uh -oh. so the counselor wakes up in the morning and there's an empty bed in the cabin and kind of sets off this search for the camper, who it turns out is the daughter of the family that owns a summer oh. camp. Yeah. That's not and a you soon thing. learn years ago, her brother went missing. Oh. So it's kind of like a repeat for the family, which seems super traumatic. Yeah. I, mean, um, uh, I think I would probably take greater steps not to have my second kid go missing. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so. So that, there's like a few things where like it you maybe have to just like let go and just like go along with the story <laughs> you get lots of people's perspectives um like there's the camp counselor's perspective there's um the mom who's like a really troubled character who's kind of married into this family and has been manipulated all along and mm. um and then like you get some of the campers perspectives. So, you know, oh. it all comes together. I mean, it's like, and you go back in time to learn what happened to the younger brother. Um, so there are a couple of mysteries being solved of like, you, they never learned how the younger brother died. Like he went missing and ended up dead, but they don't know like what happened. So you're sort of like learning that mystery at the same time that you're like searching for the camper and you do learn what happens to her. Um, and, it, and you just keep going like back and forth in time and, um, so it's just like a really well crafted book, I would say. Hmm. Like learning things when you learn them. Just you like know. Lego pieces fit together well. Yeah, exactly. And it all worked for me. Like, and it was like a very satisfying read that kind of, like I said, it being a little bit more literary, like you maybe had to work a tiny bit harder than like your average mystery. It's not like a breezy mystery or whatever. Mm, yeah. Um, but like that. yeah. it's like, it's Good. so it's like some but, plot, yeah. but yeah, yeah. kind of sounds a little bit like hotel New Hampshire for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> it's not quite as weird as that book, but I don't know. There's no like uh, bear yeah. sex or yeah, whatever. I don't, I don't know why I made me think of hotel New Hampshire. Um, uh, so the only other book I have is, um, I probably, I'll probably talk about it next time. I've, I've started, um, Hallie Butler's new banal nightmare. I really, I've only read like 50 pages of it. So I won't talk about nice. it next time, but uh, do you know Hallie Butler? I'm, the name's yeah. familiar. The, her bio is strong. Like she, okay. uh, she has two novels, Jillian and the new me. And the new me was like a best book of the year by Vanity Fair, Vulture, Chicago Tribune, Bustle, NPR. I never heard okay. of it. She was a, she was Grant, a best of young American novelists under 35. Oh yeah. Very uh, strong bio. I'm not familiar. So I'm looking no, forward to hearing about that. Like the first 50 pages are really good. It's, um, it's about a woman who bails out of New York city to go home to her small town 
and you know the the first part is about how shitty her boyfriend is that she was leaving um but cool. uh, so far, i've got a whole stack of books to choose from i just don't know what i'm going to read next there's so many good choices i know there's uh i need some new books um this is my last of the most recent arc poll so Okay, we'll work. Uh, hey, I'm going to come see you tonight. Maybe I'll bring you some books. Oh, yeah, bring some books. Absolutely, that's a good idea. Um, it's mom's birthday. Um, also, it, we really should... I'm going to do a better job of trying to read books by famous people because when I put famous people in the subject line, yes. we get more views. So uh, the okay, YouTube, fine. YouTube video, we have 125 views. Ooh, wow. There's a lot. <laughs> Um, and it's only just because I put Keanu Reeves in the you know subject line. So I think we have to do a better job of reading because we don't usually get ARCs by the big people because they don't. We always you know. get the ARCs by the famous people, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll look. I'm on my way into the store now. I'll see what we have. All right. So I, I, maybe we'll start a new feature on the pod, which is Sam reads a book by a famous person right. uh, that he normally would not read. So we'll, okay. see what, we'll see what happens there. We'll see what we have. Usually... I toss those. I'm just kidding. I don't. Um, uh, is Elizabeth Strauss like what's famous? There aren't that like many know. actors sending me their galleys. Well, that's true. I don't, know. I don't just like we just have to start doing a little more calculus about who is the most famous person here. I don't know. Like maybe we just you know click. Who's the most, I'm going to look at the RC shelf. Elizabeth Strauss with, famous. Who's the most famous person on this shelf? Right. Maybe yeah. I should read that new James Patterson Michael Crichton book. I think you should read that. It's the one about the volcano, right? I it's about a, it's called eruption. Yeah, so. a volcano. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll read that. I liked Michael Crichton back in the day. Andromeda Strain. That's tight. Mm-hmm. So, am I bringing you that? If you have it, yeah, bring that. Don't like you know buy it. Just give me the shitty one. I don't have that. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna pay money for it. <laughs> That's not getting out of hand. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> But people should spend their money without some people books. should spend their money on it. But you know, I'm just a broke bookstore owner. I can't be spending money on James Patterson. Come on now. Oh boy. Uh, on that note, on that note, um, do we have some new summer hours that people should know about? I think we're taking a vacation, aren't we? We're it's like a tiny time taking a vacation. Um, yeah. Fourth of July week. So there are, there's a tiny adjustment of hours. We're closing early on Wednesday, July 3rd at 2 p.m. Mm. And we'll be closed through the July 4th holiday, reopening at 10 a.m. on Friday, July 5th. Wow. All right. So if so, you I mean, show that's like up a at whole, 9 a.m. Like, on the 5th, you are going to have a bad time. Yeah. I mean, it's five hours extra. We're closing. Wow. I mean, plus it's July 4th, which is a national holiday. I have no holiday, idea so. why you didn't take more time off. But so we will see you at camp. Uh, and ooh, is that Wellesley in the background? Look, it's Wells. That was Wells. Wells is awake. Summer Sorry. vacation, nine forty. Wake up. Nice. All right. Uh, so uh, now that everybody has been apprised of the hours, we will uh, we'll have lots of doc reading between the next time we see you, and uh, we will tell you all about those books next time. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.